So it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce you to Meg Poe, who is going to be leading us through an interactive experience looking at, again, her professional question, how we can learn to live, love, and work well. My pleasure, Meg Poe. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a mic tug. I love that. That's the sound of a mic tug. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. Um, what a pleasure to be here. What a pleasure to see you all here um, for this talk. Um, this talk is uh, going to be interactive. I know you're all game. I talked to Robin. I already have a sense of the spirit that's been here and the spirit in the room. So we're going to really go for it today. And I appreciate your full presence. And on that note, Rumi always says, I mean, I feel like you're already so present, so I don't even need to say this, but I will quote Rumi and say, the task in life and love is not to seek for love, but to remove the barriers, right? To remove the barriers to love and to feeling the love that's there to experience. So on that note, I ask you to remove any barriers to today, which might be your cell phone, your laptop. Um, we're going to do an analog version of this. Um, and the reason being is I want, your, uh, I want you to experience each other in full presence and really feel that sort of high voltage amplified effect of when we're all totally here. And I, I'm not asking you guys anything. I don't ask my class that I uh, teach at NYU on love. And in the first day, sometimes like a person or two will um, uh, get on the Instagram or whatever. And it's like the class springs a leak, you know, and then another, and you start feeling the Facebook leaks. And the, so there's something about keeping it all here. So thank you for that. Um, okay. I want to start. Um, uh, Robin gave such a beautiful, thorough introduction. And the only, I like to bring all myself into the room when I talk. And so this is a self that I'm going to add in. And this is, this is um, the artist part of me. So another thing that I do is I make art. And some of these that I'm going to show you were recently shown at BAM as part of a um, beautiful production on revolutionary love. So why am I starting with this? So this is a stranger that I met one day when I was in Washington Square Park and decided to do an art installation for a music festival that I was involved with. And what I did with everyone that I encountered there was I asked them, did they want to participate? And, um, and then the instructions were really simple. I said, um, think of someone you love or a part of yourself you love. And um, when you've got that in your head and then in your heart, I just want you to look straight in the lens and say it until you feel it everywhere. Um, and so this is one of many, many, everyone that I asked said yes, which is interesting. I think that shows us what's on the tip of consciousness for us and what we're wanting and yearning for. And they were all super powerful, each in their own way. They are silent. So don't be shocked when there's no sound. The idea being that, um, you're really supposed to listen with your, what we call your second ear, which is your skin, your heart, et cetera. So what happens when we block one portal? and open the others. So I'm gonna play this briefly. Um, and uh, this is one of the guys. This is just in front of a tree in Washington Square Park. <laughs> so you can see, right, this transformation that happens, that state change, um, that was less than one minute. 
right, of us taking, and I can see this is the power of mere neurons and heart-to-heart transmission. You guys are all looking like he is right now, like all of you are lit up. So that's an example of a transformational habitat. And I realize no matter what I do, whether I'm in my practice um, seeing patients, whether I'm leading meditations or other things, whether I'm making art, Um, whether I'm designing and developing classes like the love class at NYU, um, it's all transformational habitat. So this is what I want us to be thinking about today. And that's what we just kind of pulled out of thin air in the park that day was a transformational habitat. So many people, there was another guy there who literally had every part of him plugged off. He had his, a scarf around his neck. He had He had um, sunglasses over his eyes. He had earphones on. There wasn't a part of him available. And I asked him just to challenge myself. And he got up there and delivered. Like, he just, he just like, like as if someone had been waiting, as if he had been waiting his whole life for someone to say, hey, you, can you express some love? And he was like, la, here I am. So anyway, um, and I just want to play you one second of this one, um, which is the, the working with dancers Um, Kristen Sudeikis Dance Company and um, collaborating with her on this piece. And um, again, just to show you, I'm just going to show you a few moments of it. Where they're really moving into this space of pure presence. And of feeling the feelings of recruiting their full selves. All the cells in their body. all of the parts of themselves and sharing that in the ways that felt good. So you can see how people hatch and how people bloom in the right circumstances. And you can feel the moment when it shifts. We all are wired to do that. So, okay. So on that note, um, I want to talk a little bit where to start. I'll start here. Um, I, wanted, I want on that note to shift into another kind of space that we often feel we're in at work. You know, in my practice, patients come in all the time. And like you guys, there are, I see a lot of leaders. I see a lot of innovators. I see a lot of incubate, like, you know, genius people doing amazing work in the world, artists, CEOs, you name it. And They'll often say, you know, why at the end of the day am I feeling so frenetic? Why am I feeling, you know, so like scattered, so pixelated, uh, like that, right? Like what's happened and very empty and frenetic, right? So I think one of my questions for today is what are we doing that the end of the day, after a day of work, we're all feeling drained and pixelated and frenetic as opposed to energized and connected? when we're with people all day, right? So on that note, I wanna have you guys take a minute to, uh, we're just gonna do a quick one minute meditation um, to start to be in this space. And then we're gonna do some exercises. We're gonna do lots of things. I'm gonna do some more talking, then we're gonna do some more exercises. And we're just gonna DJ a little bit of a mashup of everything we wanna get through today. And it's gonna feel Um, hopefully super helpful and super present. So, um, okay. So for the first minute, I invite you all to um, just take a deep breath and feel your chair, feel your feet, relax your hands, and just close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. And I just want you to, in this moment, in this minute, invite all of the parts of yourself into the room. The six-year-old, the 20-year-old, the present you, 
the 80 year old, the anxious part, the part ready to impress, the happy part, the grateful part, the scared part. And let's just let all of that exist and include, just keep including for the next minute, any sounds, it's all welcome. was a minute almost so now I'd like to from that space ask you guys a question and have you um, take a couple minutes to maybe a minute and a half let's give it to write down um, whatever comes to mind and my question for you is what do you want so yeah take a minute to get out a paper and pen and if you need one, I think there's some extras up there, or maybe your neighbor can share. And my question for you is not what do you want to do at work, but what do you want to feel? What do you want to feel at work during the day? What experiences do you want to have so that when you leave, you feel like you've given yourself something, you feel alive, you feel like you engaged with life all day long? Let it flow, let it be stream of consciousness. Even if it doesn't make sense, let it just all come out. What do you want people to tell you that make you feel a certain thing? Okay, wrapping up, three, two, one. Okay, now we're gonna do something together simultaneously. So it requires everyone to participate all at once. It's basically like a cacophonous choir. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna read your list aloud into the space and you're gonna just do it, just deliver it. And we're all gonna go at the same time and I want you to do it loud with gut, like you mean it, like, like you saying it is gonna make it happen. Gusto, I wanna see your performance, I wanna see your performative sides, right? And you can just deliver it in a stream of consciousness and just really listen to yourself say it and really put it out there, okay? Three, two, one, go. Wow. Gratitude, happiness, helpfulness, interested in me, people, self-care, self-love, exuberance, being appreciated, being heard, 
being seen, being understood, being seen. No shallow bullshit. Ta-da! <laughs> we could not have planned that grand finale better. Anyone else still got anything popping? Can we pop all the popcorn? Okay. Great. Okay. So that feels good to just say it, doesn't it? To just say it. And feeling the shift when, you know, I, 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 I think one of my purposes up here today is to get us rooted in tapping into the kind of feeling spaces and what kind of experience and what kind of creativity and what kind of knowledge can come when we start there. You know, what if we could give ourselves and the people working with us those kinds of experiences in the first 20 minutes we're there to say thank you when we know someone needs gratitude, to validate something, et cetera, rather than having that person spend all day searching, 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 searching for that thing and trying to grasp after it and we're sort of confused by their behavior. You know, what if we spoke and what if we asked? So these are sort of themes to, to think about. Okay, so a little more on time and love. So what metaphors do we use to describe time? Because I think, as I said, a lot of what happens at work, I find is that people feel, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough space. I can't do that. I didn't make time to do that. Everything is calendared in boxes, which I think is really interesting that this is the human design of a calendar. Why is it not a spiral? Why is it not, you know? So starting from there, we box everything in and, and we allow this much time for things. And we don't always think about, well, what's inside that experience? Some of the metaphors we use, of course, is this, right? Tick, 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 I'm losing it. Spend, squander, waste, lose, find, buy, have, make, create. These are our metaphors for time. They're, none of them re resemble any kind of infinite spaciousness, right? It's all about losing and anxiety and panic. We seem to view time like this, right? Like an envelope or something that's... But how do we really experience time? That's something very different. Time has always been used against us on a certain level. The invention of the clock made us accountable to the employer, gave us standard measure and a stopwatch management, and also led to, to, to the requirement of interest bearing currency to grow over time, the requirement of the expansion of our economy, right? So these are some of the, the themes that we're used, the ways that we're used to thinking about time. But what if we transitioned from that into experiencing time as literally an intersection of time and space, of literally every minute of our day being devoted in some sense intentionally to some kind of experience, right? Whatever that experience is that we need to have and whatever we need to, to bring to it. So, and what do we want to do with that? So now I want to go back. I filled that in a little bit. And you can look at all those. Those are the phase change that I was talking about in the love portraits initially. Same thing, listening with the inner ear. The tracks we make flow. And here we are back at Eric Fromm. So thinking of time as an experience, I want to now fold in another concept for you guys. And, and the concept is love, right? Which is not, not something we think about at work. I have a good friend who works at the Harvard Business Review. Um, she's uh, an amazing woman. And she said that one of the most powerful moments in her whole work career was when one of her bosses looked around the room and said, I love you all. And she said why it was so powerful was because he meant it and they meant it. And it, and it went in on that level. And that's, that shouldn't be seen as corny or taboo. There's nothing deeper and less corny than love, actually, right? But it's, it's not something that we linguistically bring. We don't bring that syntax, that vocabulary, into the workplace so much, or even the feeling state of it. So Eric Fromm is one of my absolute favorites. He's one of the backbones of the class I teach at NYU. And he talks about love. He wrote a book called The Art of Loving. He wrote a lot of amazing books that, if you guys are interested, you should check out. Um, you all. You're not all guys. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, The Art of Being, there's many, many. But in The Art of Loving, he starts from this place of time and space and presence. And I, I just want to read you a little bit of this. But basically, he's coming at the topic of, is love an art? Is it something we can practice? 
right? Or is it something that we just need to acquire passively? So I'm going to read a little bit. Is love an art? Then it requires knowledge and effort. Or is love a pleasant sensation, which to experience is a matter of chance, something one falls into if one is lucky? This little book is based on the former premise, while undoubtedly the majority of people today believe in the latter. Not that people think that love is not important. They are starved for it. They watch endless numbers of films about unhappy and happy love stories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This peculiar attitude is based on several premises which either singly or combined tend to uphold it. Most people see the problem of love primarily as that of being loved rather than that of loving, of one's capacity to love. Hence, the problem to them is how to be loved, how to be lovable. In pursuit of this aim, they follow several paths. And then he goes on to express some of those. But the, the meat and the sort of the marrow of what I want to impart to you guys today around this idea is this idea that it's active and it's an art and it's a practice. And basically, his whole thesis of this book is, if love is an art, then it is something that we can practice. And if it's something that we can practice, then it's something that needs our presence. And if it's something that needs our presence, then it needs our attention. But the problem is most people aren't paying attention at all. They're not paying attention to themselves. They're not paying attention to others. They're distracted. Their mind is splayed out in a million directions. So it's very hard to give and receive love. There isn't that much of a listening, a true listening state, right? And that's something we're going to practice in a few minutes. Um, we kind of throw ourselves around and hurl ourselves to and throw, hoping to be lovable, hoping to be loved, hoping to get something, hoping to X, Y, and Z, and not necessarily digging into the inner world, the inner life of what we actually need and want and what we want to feel. We don't, we're not here that long. What do we want to feel as humans? What do we want to practice in our bodies? What do we want to practice relationally? What do we want to create? You know, these are, these are the questions that we're really trying to get at and, and, and find a way to design in life, find a way to be in command of. So thank you, Eric Fromm. The other thing I want to mention is Winnicott, who, again, is just an absolute brilliant writer in mind. And he talks about the capacity to be alone as part of this ability to share and to be present with others. And um, he starts it as mother and infant when you're um, a baby becoming a person. He said, one of the most important things you can learn for your imagination, for your creativity, for your capacity to love, for um, evolving consciousness, for flow, for play, for not, what was your phrase? Not dealing with the bullshit, <laughs> beyond, being beyond the bullshit. What, what comes into all of this is the capacity to be alone. And what do I mean by that? I don't, I'm not talking about loneliness. I'm, and I'm not talking about the capacity to be by yourself. I'm talking about our capacity to be with, with ourself and with ourself all day long in the workplace, at home, out to dinner, wherever it might be. So I just want to throw that in. He's another one really worth looking at. Mihaly on flow. If there's time. We won't. If we had three hours, my love class is three hours. So for me to do everything I want to do in an hour is it's good for me. <laughs> OK, so we went through these. And I want to weave that into my next thing I'd like to share with you guys, which is this idea of the imprint that we make all day long. So another thing that I want us to all be thinking about is if time is presence in love, and time is space, and time is energy, and space is transformation. And transformation is done through love, among many other forces. 
then what are we bringing energetically into each moment that we exist? Like for example, when I was coming here a few minutes ago, my train skipped over five stops, including the stop on the front end that I was supposed to get off at to come here. And I didn't have that much time because of, I was seeing patients this morning. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be late to my own talk that I'm giving on time and energy. This is horrible. I'm gonna walk in here and I'm gonna be frazzled. And I'm gonna be like, oh, sorry guys, sorry, sorry, sorry. And, and, and I was like, no, this is perfect. This is perfect because I am gonna be on time. I'm gonna figure it out. And it's putting me exactly in the state, in the headspace and the body, like even more of an embodied space of what it means to actually practice these things. And I was like, if I can't practice it, then what am I doing up here, right? So I had to, you know, obviously calm myself down and find my center and meditate. I went through the line of cabs and found the cab driver that looked the most zen, that knew where the Museum of Moving Image was, and I picked him. And he was like, girl, you gotta relax. And I was like, yes, thank you, I do, thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, it was this whole thing that was, that was happening and trying to get here. But it's exactly, it's perfect because it's what I'm here to talk about. And, and so I did it, I got here, I saw Grace. Grace was like, would you like to meditate gently? would you like to meditate for a minute, Megan? I was like, yes, that's perfect. Caught my breath, and now here we are. And it reminds me of this whole idea of this kind of like, what fossil are we bringing into each moment? You know, It's so sensitive that even when I have a patient that's left the room and the next pa patient enters, they'll often say, if, if the last one was like, feeling kind of panicky and anxious, and maybe they were talking about their brother or something and something that went wrong. The next patient often comes in, and if they're a pretty sensitive, porous person who's tuned in, they might walk in and then be like, why do I suddenly feel anxious? Why do I suddenly want to talk about my brother who I haven't thought about in a long And it's amazing what actually can get transferred, and you sort of don't believe it until you've seen it like in your 10,000 hours, but it's something called morphic resonance that some of you have probably heard of. And so thinking about that in terms of this, what energy are we bringing into each moment and what are we carrying with us that doesn't need to be there? So if I would have come on stage and come up here and been like, hi guys, I'm sorry, I'm, so, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so late, here you are, you're all here, and I'm so, you, can you feel how that already puts me at, at the center and everyone's here? And suppose now, like we were in a big meeting already and the meeting was happening. And I like walked in injecting that energy into maybe what was already like a really happening, productive, great, grooving, like amplifying meeting. And suddenly I've taken all the, I've like drained all the energy out of the meeting and I've imposed, overimposed myself. As, and it's not to say that we don't want to own when we're late, but what if instead I walked into the meeting and just said, I'm so happy to be here and sat down and said, please continue. And then afterwards I say, I'm sorry, I had, I was running, I got stuck or whatever. And so just keeping these kinds of things in mind as we're bringing our, all of these concepts together, love, presence, transformational habitats, because this is really what we're trying to do, right? Is, is be in the moment so we can evolve ourselves and evolve the workplace. And shouldn't those go together? Shouldn't those go together? Shouldn't a workplace also be a space where the individuals get to evolve and amplify each other? What if work, what if work, was a place where you were constantly being asked to grow. And I know some of you do have this for sure, but to grow and grow the, the space at the same time. What if the workplace was literally a transformational habitat and you had the support to do that? Nice. Feels good, right? That question feels good. I'm looking here at spheres, thinking of time as more spherical than linear, thinking of growth as spirals. These are metaphors I just wanna leave you with. Thinking of inner life as terrain. Okay, 
This image I pulled because as we're doing this and as we're thinking along these lines, what we're called to do is to redesign time in our own lives and think of it more as a space, a place that you enter into, right? I pulled this image because this is how I design my own time in my own life. I start with the Central Park and I build Manhattan around it, meaning I start with my free time and my flow time and my creative time and I build what needs to be built around that. Now, you might think that I'm not very busy, but I'm the mother of three young kids, mm -hmm. <laughs> including twins. So this is no small feat. And I'm a professor, and I have a practice, and I didn't mention it yet, although I meant to. Um, I'm also starting my own company with a couple co-founders, and we're basing a lot of it on the ethos that I'm talking about today. And it's sort of the intersection of healing and art and wellness and lots of things that hopefully you'll hear about in the next couple of years. Um, so this I call, like to call time design, and we can apply it to work, our own selves, inner parks. What are our inner parks? So this... I'm going to come back to that. Stillness, Pico Iyer. You get the idea. And the whole point of this, of course, is to live our own life, right? We're neuroplastic beings, meaning that we are, our brains can constantly change themselves, right? So neuroscientifically, whatever we put in is going to give us more of that. So if we're on our devices all day and it's our choice, we're constantly interrupting ourselves, allowing ourselves to be interrupted, that's going to create certain patterns. If we're being mindful of that and maybe blocking out time where that it doesn't exist, what comes out of those spaces, right? Just different kinds of growth. One looks more like a tree with a lot of branches. The other looks more like blades of grass or something. Not to say it's good or bad, but these questions of how do we want to interact with technology? Are we using it? Is it using us? Time is not at all what it seems to be. It is not flowing in one direction and the future exists simultaneously with the past. Okay. And there we are. I threw this slide in because I wanted to show you um, that concept of high voltage, high energy when we're all present, what that looks like, what that feels like, how much, how electrifying it is. And, and, and what, if, what if we demand that at work from each other you know, how many meetings have we all been in where people are on their phone half the time and maybe 12% of each person is actually there? What does that up to, add up to versus 100%? This is just, again, a message of passing time within ourselves and that that's really at the heart of all of this, right, is for us each to learn how to do that in the ways we need to to be human. Now I want to shift, and we're going to do another exercise in a minute, because I want to give us time to do that. And then I want to have a little time for dialogue at the end, too. But next, um, I want us to think about, so that's sort of the self, right? And now, and we're starting to talk about meetings, but now I want us to go into the next notch, which is if we're each doing this, how do we do this together, right? We all know the power of synchronizing. We all know the creative energy that happens when we're actually there. So I invite us to just think about meetings for a minute and how do we even think about what a meeting is, whether it's two people or whether it's 20 people, looking at these concepts. So this is what I'm trying to do today. <laughs> Teach and live, right? Teach about the planets in the planet. Okay, there's the barriers. Morphic resonance. We talked about all this already. Meetings. Okay. 
So on to this concept. And some of the slides I just, I like to put in there so you can just kind of have that sense of them. We don't have to talk about everyone, but it just kind of this moment to kind of pause and have some visuals. Um, so meetings. What if we take the word meeting for what it actually is, as opposed to, you know, seeing it as like a task and a to-do list, a meeting, like Eric Fromm talks about um, core to core or center to center, where you're really actually meeting with someone. You're meeting someone. There's contact, true contact of our essences, of who we are. So Martin Buber wrote a book. The title confused me at first. He called it Meetings. But the book wasn't really about other people at all. It was about um, the times in his life that he had transformational encounters. So what he's calling meetings is the thing that stuck with him that evolved him. And one happened when he was six, and one happened when he was 10, and one happened when he was 18. And each chapter is like a mini version of that experience of what made him who he was. And that's what he called meetings. Everyone is on the internet, here's David Lynch, but they're not talking with each other. There are groups upon groups out there, but they don't talk to one another. So while the internet brings everyone into a shared space, it does not necessarily bring them together. That's our part, right? That's the part of connection, that's the part of love, that's the part of humanness. So on that note, I would like for you guys to have a meeting, a new kind of meeting with each other. Um, it's gonna take four minutes and it's gonna feel eternal. <laughs> I'm warning you in a good way, though, in a good way. Um, and uh, you're going to have a real encounter with someone now. So I'm going to explain, um, and we're going to partner off. So, And if someone doesn't have a partner, just raise your hand, and we'll, we can do a trio and what have you. But the exercise goes like this. Um, it's an exercise that is going to demand you to be totally heart-centered and speak from the heart and speak from the truth. So some of you are not, you know, or maybe all of you here are, but a lot of people in the world are not necessarily used to really speaking from that place and speaking aloud. Um, and what, what we're gonna do, and then on the other side uh, is equally important is the receiver. And that person is going to totally listen from the same space without interrupting, you can nod, but no words, um, and just be, be with that person in that experience. And then we're gonna switch. So it's two minutes each. And the exercise is really simple, but it's, it's a challenge. And it goes like this. Uh, you say, I am, and then whatever comes out next. So I am Megan. I am a psychiatrist. I am on stage. I am excited. I am scared. I am grateful, you know, and keep going. I am overly concerned about whatever comes in, you know, and keep going and just let it be a stream for two minutes, looking at that person in the eye, and then we're gonna switch. And go deep, dig deep, um, be epic. Say things you've never said aloud. This other person is here for you. You guys are an amazing group. You've got each other. So really, really go for it. I really encourage that. And listener, when you're on the listening end, feel what it feels like to listen with your whole self. It's really different. We don't always do it. Just be there for your whole self, not what you're going to say next or anything. Just there you are. That's like as equally important. And then we're going to switch. OK? Anyone have any questions about how to do it? So each time, I am, and then fill in the blank, I am. I am. And I will be our timekeeper and space holder. Um, everyone find a partner now. And let and, and just just wave your hand if you don't if you don't have one. Okay, here's one. Here's okay, you guys are a pair? Who else needs a pair? Just have one, so we have an odd number. Anybody? You got one? Oh, you got a trio? Okay. Okay, awesome. All right. So, are we ready? 
Does anybody else need a partner? Okay, awesome. Okay, so say hello to your partner and decide who's going to go first. Okay, and I'm going to say three, two, one, and then go. Okay, three, two, one, go. Keep going, guys. Three, two, one. OK, two minutes. <laughs> OK, thank your partners. Thank you. Yeah, is, OK, isn't that amazing? So just to illustrate, right? What, how did you guys experience those two minutes? Longer, yes, much longer, right? So we're, bend we're time bending in here today, which was the ultimate point, right, is to bend time and space. Yeah, what, any, anybody else have a, a feeling that's, of how it was? Yeah. For me, it felt short. It felt short, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And moved, yeah. So maybe you guys can have a, a longer, an eight-minute session after you guys can arrange that and go back in, because that's good. That, that means something was going through you and your partner was really holding that space for you. And how about from the listening side? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow, yeah. Thank you for saying that. I just got chills everywhere. Like that's, that's exactly right. Like you can feel someone, feel their music, feel their essence, feel their all of it, their struggles. And four minutes, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Beautifully put. Yeah. Beautifully said. And also, also this, um, what you're describing in terms of all these different layers of each of us, like we're almost like geological layers, right? Where we're drilling down and both of, you know, and, and investing in that way. And then all the different, we're, we're multidimensional beings. You know, if I have one thing I wanna teach my daughter, it's, it's that, it's why I bring all the parts of myself here because, you know, we are, we are multidimensional and we should get to, you know, bring more of ourselves into into life in each moment. There was a hand up there, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes, great point too. We don't often listen to ourselves and we don't, you know, and often we're listening to a thought in our own head instead of listening to the other. And then when we're speaking, we're not actually overhearing ourselves. One of my favorite professors, Harold Bloom, talked about what makes Shakespearean characters so genius is that they're constantly overhearing themselves and evolving during the plays, you know? And that's what we can do too. We can really overhear ourselves and listen and be inside of that and inhabit it that way. So beautiful, beautiful points. So um, did someone else want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. I found it hard not to try to connect with the points you were making. Of, like, I, when I heard something that was a personal connection to me, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. I, like, yeah. Really in my brain, I'm like, oh. And that's normal. That's natural. That's, that's human, too, right? We're, we're utterly relational beings. So we are going to relate it to ourselves, and it's going to help us to feel connected to the other. So it all, it all gets to be there. So I'm just going to, oh, okay, yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Is it, so you're more comfortable in the listening. It, so it's, it, that's a great point, too, because it's teaching us where do we live? Are we more comfortable being the one that, la, 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 or are we the person that's more like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? And so it, it also teaches us that about, like, where were we comfortable? Where were we uncomfortable? Um, where can we grow? What is it? So it's just such a pure act in that way as an exercise and as, a, as an encounter. I don't even want to call it exercise. That's like watering it down. It was an encounter. So just, just in our final moments together, um, so ideas of meetings, real meetings, talking sticks, being part of this wave, right? Um, part of community, collective consciousness, shared beliefs and different beliefs. Um, the capacity to feel wonder is essential to the creative process. So that's the other thing that we just did, right? Is like, there's this wonder in there. There's love, there's the other. So I'll just leave you with a little Agnes Martin, who's one of my favorite artists. Happiness is being on the beam with life, to feel the pull of life. So that's my wish for all of us here in the world is to be on the beam of life and to feel the pull of life and to give it back and forward to others. And um, and uh, yeah, and I'll just say we've got a minute or two, I think. Is that right, Grace, for questions? Yeah, great. So that's the end of the talk. And um, thank you so much for having me. And then. <laughs> and thank you. It's such a pleasure. And we have a, a minute or two for dialogue if people have other thoughts based on what just happened. I always think it's good to save a little bit of space to just integrate a little bit. So anybody else that's thinking about anything we talked about today, it doesn't have to be the exercise. Yeah. Would you recommend to help people kind of presence in their day-to-day -day, like you yeah. work or you get late for a meeting or rushing? Great or question. Stuff? Yes, it only takes one minute. It doesn't even take a minute. So I, I, I love timers for this, just to set a timer for one minute and say, for this minute, I'm just gonna be here. I'm just gonna breathe or give yourself some kind of prompt. I'm just gonna, I was out at a, a, on a hike the other day going to this waterfall upstate. And I, and I just, I wanted, I was feeling a little scattered and I just stopped and let my whole family go ahead of me. And I literally just took one minute and I said, I'm just gonna listen to every noise that comes in and I'm just gonna be here. And so it can be quick and you can give yourself some kind of prompt like that and some kind of, um, some kind of sense of, it's, it's really just retuning the instrument, right? Because, and I like using the metaphor of instrument because like a guitar, for those of us that play guitar, if, you, if it's out of tune, all day, you're strumming, it sounds terrible. Your music is all off key. No one wants to hear that, no one wants to listen. But if you take a minute to tune it, then it's a totally different experience, right? So it's that, it's really just taking a minute to tune. And you could just say that, I want, I'm gonna tune myself for the next minute. And it doesn't take an hour, it doesn't take a whole retreat. It doesn't, I mean, these things are amazing, right? But you can do it very quickly. We forget that as people, we are wired to retune very quickly. It's part of our resilience. It's part of our neuroplasticity. So that's that would be my short answer. Yeah. What else? And to really give yourself permission to do that. Yeah. And it, yeah. Absolutely, hundred percent. I'm a long time meditator, and I think. Um, one of the benefits of meditation is that you, you know, somebody once said, you know, the heart beats involuntarily. Heart beats, right? Heart beats involuntarily. And the mind thinks involuntary thoughts. It's an organ. It's a very useful instrument for us. But I think what meditation does is it allows us to zoom out and see the mind as that, as generating some really useful things for us and some really not useful things at all, a lot of noise. So meditation can help discern signal from noise, I think really efficiently and beautifully. Um, it's helped me in my own life expand so much 
because I can, I can sometimes feel like I'm pulling time and space out of thin air just by taking it. And the same way you guys took it in those two minutes and you used it. So yeah, I'm a huge fan. I'm a meditator. I've been trained in meditation and kundalini yoga and sound therapy. I use them in my practices too and in my talks. So yes, <laughs> great question. And I think it, it makes us more present, right? Which then makes us more able to love. That was Fromm's whole thing. And actually he sort of smuggled it in his book a little bit. He's like, so how could we one theoretically do this? And it was a time that meditation wasn't popular when he wrote it. So he described meditation without calling it that. He said, so if you sit down and you imagine a blank screen and he goes through it. So it's really interesting. Um, yeah, in the back, yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, this is an amazing group. Yeah. How do you, what is the main thing that you do when you do that? Is it like a workplace? Is there anything that's going on? Or open to it? Or just love it? Yes, that's a great question. I mean, you know, one place to start, and we start here in our company sometimes, is one minute of silence, just so that you actually arrive. Like, that's something that most people, will be grateful for. They're, they're definitely going to have different octaves of interest in meditation and consciousness. And some people that's, you know, feels too, like, too outside the box or they have to be gently, you know, they have a lot of notions of what that is. But most people could do, or you could do 30 seconds. And a lot of times I'll start a meeting like that. I'll say, it's just 30 seconds of silence. And it's amazing how much static and noise that reduces because a lot of times we're there but we're not, we haven't arrived. Like we've showed up, like, but we haven't actually arrived. And we need a minute just to kind of be like, okay, actually, okay, all the parts, I'm here. And people are grateful for that. So that's, that's one way to do it. And then I think you could introduce some really simple exercises. My experience is that when people, when we talk about it, it's one thing, it's theoretical. When we experience it in an embodied way, it's another thing. And once, you know, Eve Ensler said, the next revolution will occur in our bodies. And I understand what she means by that, because once you experience it, it, it isn't a matter of convincing. It's just something that you experience and then you're bringing into the next moment. So I would say any little exercise that you could get to do that um, could be really interesting. And I would start there with something like that and even say, you can even preface it, this is a little different, but we're just gonna try it, see how it goes. You know, bring in the air of experimentation and then people will be like, okay, well, let's try it. What's 30 seconds, this is cool, you know. Um, let me check on our time. Last question. Yes. 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 Yay. Everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I think it, I, I think... We could talk more after too, because that might be a long answer. But the short answer is it, it is infused in everything that I do. It is the part of me that I think carries my child self with me everywhere. I don't even think of it as my child self. I think of it as just my essence, my magical. One of the, um, my favorite, uh, it wasn't a, this kind of, I, I work in a lot of settings. So one of them was a, um, it was an art show that I did with someone. And um, I led uh, a meditation visualization into the magical self for people so that they could connect to that wonder again. And it was this big Chelsea art gallery with a million people and all in stilettos. And I'm like, all right, now we're gonna sit down and contact our magicals. And everyone's like, okay. And they all did it and they loved it. You know, so you never, it, it's amazing how there's, we all have that in us, you know, and it's been suppressed or filed down or just not connected to. And when people are given that opportunity, even if you just say, now we're gonna do this, you, if you just make the statement or the intention, it happens. It's like with the love portraits, build it and they will come. Like the, 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 the spirit wants to rush in. So um, like a vacuum, you know, it's like, it's like that. So we can definitely talk more, but it, it, it figures into my whole being, I would say, for sure. And everything I do, I think of as just an extension of that really. I'm not really one thing, none of us are. Yeah. Thank you guys, thank you. Thank you.